with that camera. Okay. No, no. Hello, this is JT, and I think this is done right. So um, there's a number of people, at least two people that are invited to show up. If they don't, um, so be it. Uh, as you can tell, it's pretty wonderful out there right now. Um, I was walking over here, and it reminds me of when I was a kid, late, probably 1920 or so, and um, we'd have these ferocious um, storms, um, snowstorms. I lived outside Galena, Illinois, and um, one of my favorite things to do is to get this huge, um, funky old coat that was probably down to my ankles. It looked like it was made out of bear or something, and then I would tie it with the scarf and it'd be all bundled up and I'd grab a bottle of sake and the thing is the problem with drinking in the snow is you get really relaxed you fall asleep and obviously you die but what I would do is I'd get on the railroad tracks and so I would never because I, I can get lost in a room um, just turning on this radio show every week is kind of a miracle as it is um, it's not that I'm dumb it's just I don't know it's just it's not there there's your coffee thing um, so I'd wander, and I'd go up, and I just, um, it would be just wonderful, and it would just be mind-boggling, and the moon would be out, it would be like me and the moon, and whatever animals might be prowling, and um, it always had a huge influence. It's probably like one of the first loves of my life. I, um, I entered poetry pretty much um, through a little of the beats. I, I like Kerouac early on, but I never really got into poetry through, you know, standard Western. It was definitely through Kenneth Rexroth and um, Chinese and Japanese. And um, the relationship with the moon is definitely a lot more... See you later, Keith. Um, a lot more present than a lot of um, Western poetry, even though, obviously, you know, you do have Westerners, um, all sorts, that incorporate it. I mean, it's just, it's a huge major part of our life. It'd be kind of stupid to ignore it. But like Lebo and Han Chan, and it's just, it was just wonderful, and I just felt like I was kind of like living that life, and um, it was good. It was very good because it came from a really um, odd place. Um, what I wanted to do um, more than anything is just it's just something that really got into me over the last couple of weeks is I wrote um, the series of poems called Paloma back in the um, end of 06 and um, a number of things were going on and it's just kind of a nice little piece that I like. Um, Paloma is named after this um, amazingly beautiful um, young Hispanic man that I met um, in this really strange um, kind of bar in Chicago. My nephew took me there, and um, it was definitely a transgender, transvestite. It was something like black cat, white cat, I can't remember. Well, next door to it was kind of like a um, after-party place, so um, you get any kind of substance you wanted. So I went there with my nephew after a incredibly horrible Thanksgiving um, with my brother, their father, and um, so my nephew and I um, went to Chicago. I had a little bit of money, and then we went to this place, and what was wonderful is, you know, I was the uncle, so all these just wonderful women, um, a few gay men were just, they are just incredible. It was just, um, it was a really nice mix, and it had a huge influence, and Paloma and I hit it off. It was just like this, this kind of train experience that we only had so much time, and he really wanted to go back to a room and have sex, and I really wasn't interested in that. It was more of a thing like, it was nice just kissing. We had the bar to ourselves, and we would just follow each other around, whether it was to the bathroom or to the you know pool table, and we just kissed, and it was just, it had a really nice impact on me because it was overwhelmingly sweet, and um, it, very healing. So um, this whole series of poems is... Um, called Paloma, which also means dove, but um, the poems are too, he, he lurks in here, but it's, um, the poems are for Amanda, um, my grandson's uh, mother, um, Evan, and um, Conroy, who is um, another wonder that I had met at um, Club Anything, and it's just, um, I miss him, I just, I really wish I could connect with him again. Um, we had a lot of nice times together, it was just you know, there's, there's, as you all know, there's these, these moments where, you know, you just connect with somebody and you think you have all the time in the world and 
you don't. It's so fleeting. But Conroy had an amazing impact on me. And then, of course, the the last person on this is Noah, my son, um, which um, he will always be, just like Evan will always be, a part. Um, so I kind of want to read these, and um, they're not titled, but I'll give you a few moments between them so you know it's another poem. You, the, what we rose to rise, heat, stench, despair, all toss, all redeem, within muscle sleeps purity, upon your neck, my fear. Soothe this dream, this tender, this, you, the. Tell me, my breath, will you? Hold me against, walk me along the he shell, elastic against memory. These teeth, my pigeons, my skyscraper, my deliverance, I shall, my. Let song, let grind as the days may, shall we? Elegant of departure, I hold a tolerant candle, a watchman's cap, sanctified. We the haphazard English, more meat than verboten, the silent lovers, I bathe in. Reek your melody, firms against belly, this blood. Feathers through teeth, the white that dries clear. In an unheated room, cat piss, cardboard luggage, reminders of a curtsy, soothsayer. Against fence, in favor of freedom. Fifth and national, I wander home. Still drunk, the snow offers comfort. Drink coffee instead. I still miss someone. Your hand became clothesline, a way to drape, tug home. I wish not to poison you, my memory, my chosen. Good thought become clothespin. Dreamt of being a fireman, rescue trapped chickens. Children, may you always ask why. Thought of vomit, given glass vase, trembles tenderness. In the morning breath, as if slept in a Boy Scout's tent. Thought as love, held out New Testament. Shall birth be defined, pleasure shall life deliver. Tonight, I'm on my way. In bed resign, macaroni and poetry, G's bend, belly titters. No problem growing old, the loss it ensures. Silence carries her excuses home, a moment as perfect as sun-filled reverie. You, my chemist, botanist, burn all as morning, consume your heart. Screams become tears, swallow a line declaration of love, sacrifice. What will determine sleep? A riddle shall ask. With this, my love, I fall from name. Crocodile dung will never stop babies from being born. Scream of shadows, mayhem of the multitude, this birth a blessed one, of rain, tolerant umbrella. That's it. Um, and I th one of um, my possible guests is going to call in. Um, we'll see if he does. But the other thing I kind of want to do with the show, I think it's going to be open to a lot of things. I think eventually I'm going to get into um, get some bands in here, especially from out of town, let them talk, uh, play their music. But um, the other thing I want to do <coughs> is read some fiction, to read some really... Um, nice fiction that I that I really um, love and um, it'll be short pieces and I, I came upon this big table number three um, it was published I want to it's definitely from Chicago and I thought for some reason it might be with the university there but it's, it's not um, but like Paul Carroll was an editor and um, just some really nice things in here um, Ginsburg's in here um, just um, Robert Duncan, John Ricci, John Ashbery, um, Paul, well, Paul Carroll, James Wright. Um, 
Peter Lovsky, Ferlinghetti. But it also has one of my favorites, Jean Genet. The piece I'm going to read is called The Beggars of Barcelona. Rain. With the other shameless beggars, Lucian crouched against stone in the wasteland near the port where bums were permitted to gather. Small twig fires. Rice and beans brought back in tin cans from the grate of the army camp were cooked into soup. This soup, coming from those magnificent soldiers in whose company Lucian would certainly have been the most beautiful. This soup, abandoned by the soldiers and given with scorn and pity. This soup choked Lucian. His heart felt sick. Tears hardened inside his eyes. Rain squelched the fires. Wisps of black smoke lingered. The beggars tried to save their soup by ha hiding the cans under a coat or a bag of burlap draped around their shoulder. This wasteland was at the bottom of, a tall, of the tall wall which supports the boulevard leading into the rambles. Passing people leaned over the parapet and saw a court of miracles where one could always watch measly disputes, measly scrap, measly bartering. Each act was a parody. The poor are grotesque. The activities of the beggars of Barcelona were the distorted reflection of the sublime adventures enacted in some rich home by people worthy of being observed and heard. When the beggars cursed or scramped among themselves, they would reduce the violence of their every gesture and whine so that would lack the dignity reserved by your world. With squinty eyes, other bums watched these fights. But even their watching was a mere reflection. At some funny or sharp insult or some sudden flow of eloquence goaded by a blow to cleverly given, the bums would refuse to smile or mutter one word of admiration. In the secret place of their hearts, mutely, they blamed the insult or eloquence as a kind of incongruity, their prudence scorned it. One beggar would never say to another with a hint of any pity in his voice, don't worry, old man, it'll pass. These gentlemen reeked tact. To avoid any crack through which distress might enter, they cultivated an indifference resembling the most aggravated politeness. Their language kept the classic reserve. Knowing themselves to be shadows or reflections deformed and wretched, they worked passionately to gain a painful discretion of emotion and gesture. They didn't speak in a low voice. Their tone was somewhere between bass and soprano. The scene I want to tell you about took place in the rain, but even at high noon under that July sun, the gentle spring of rain made the beggars shiver. Sometimes a soldier appeared. He snapped a few words in Spanish, and five or six of the most humbled, old, ugly beggars would scramble miserably. Two were picked and led to the laundry where they wrung and dried the wash. Lucian never answered these calls. He stared straight ahead. From the bowels of his hut of sadness, he watched a distant sea getting wet. He kept staring. He was sure he would never come out of this dream. Filth only highlighted his traits. Sweat oiled his smooth face. Only rarely he shaved, and then badly. He soaped his beard with his fingers, because he hadn't, as of yet, broken, as I had broken, the ties which hold prisoner those whose only chance is indifference. Lucien kept a relationship with your world through his beauty and youth and the cultivation of his eloquence and through his hunger and need for worldly, worldly glory. It is painful for me to degrade him, deg degrade him. My joy would be great if I could call him rascal, thief, crook, beggar. Pretty names meant to imply what you call in derision call a pretty world. Yet these words sing, they hum, they evoke for you the sweetest and most voluptuous delights. For on the sly you use them with such adjectives as sweetheart, tender, dear, adorable, beloved. All these they subtly evoke and you say them softly to your lovers. Let Lucian despair, let me suffer for it. 
whatever the veil of prudence, whenever the veil of prudence is ripped and the shameful parts are exposed, I feel my cheeks burn because I know the need to hide or to die. But I believe that by squarely facing such painful awkwardness, I shall meet through, the, through indecency some type of pec peculiar beauty. I use this word all the time because I hope to discover a pure word where without disturbing the emotion, without disturbing the love, I will hear a discreet but futile laughter. Lucine was suffering secretly because he was macerating. Whenever he looked at his dirty hands, a quick jerk of rage would drive him to a public fountain. Courageously, he would scrub his face, chest, then his hands, feet. With a half-toothless comb, he'd rake his hair. But this attempt to return you was futile. A few days later, and the filth nibbled his courage. More and more, the wind froze and hunger sapped him. But his wasn't the aristocratic weakness of a languid illness. His body always remained beautiful. This he couldn't hide. It would have been insolent. Still, a dreadful stench kept him away from you. One day, some French terrorists, tor tor terrorists, tourists leaned over the parapet. Their ship had docked for a few hours and they were sightseeing. Strangers, rich, wrapped in good raincoats, they permitted themselves a privilege to discuss, to discover the pituous island of misery. Visiting, visiting misery, in fact, was the secret purpose of their cruise. They couldn't have cared less about the beggar's feelings. Leaning over the parapet, the tourists launched into pre precise conversation among themselves in clear technical terms. How superb, this harmony between the colors of the sky and the greenish shade of these rags. This slight touch of Goya. Note that the group on the left a scene from Gustave Doré, his compositions. Actually, they're happier than we are. They appear more sordid than the beggars of Biddle, Bidden, Biddenville. Remember Casablanca? Don't you agree that the Arabic costume affords a simple beggar a kind of dignity which a European beggar lacks? Such absolute lethargy. I do wish we caught them during a nice sunny day. On the contrary, their originality. From the depths of their warm clothes, the tourists observed the shriveled populations, chins jabbed against knees so poorly protected from wind and rain. Such hate and envy I felt in my heart against those rich tourists who strolled among with their air of disgust. But prudence always warned beggars to squelch their feelings, look submissive, grovel. The rich obey the laws of money. Lucia felt, Lucian felt anguish when he saw them approach. It was his first examination. Strangers are always going to scrutinize his manners, Emily's weirdness. Suddenly he felt very dizzy. He fell to the bottom of the nameable. His heart burst, no air. Between the gloved hands of the Taurus, he saw the vicious eyes of the cruel cameras glitter. Some of the beggars understood French but only Lucian could distinguish how intricately the words mix with insolence with authoritative goodwill. Every beggar, annoyed, poked his head from under his blanket or rags. Hey, you, you want to earn a little money? Lucian got up with the others. He twisted and crouched to help create the scene which the tourists wanted. He even smiled when told to by an older beggar. He permitted a tourist to arrange his filthy hair on his wet forehead. Because of the dark weather, it took a long time to take the pictures. The tourists griped about the light, but they bragged about the quality of their cameras. If the other beggars felt a naive vanity in being part of this kind of picturesque scene which makes Spain beautiful, Lucien felt flooded by shame. He sank. The beggars became merely part of a scenic background. Because the Barcelona bums were so dumb, they squatted in the filthiest place and scorned taking taking any care of themselves. Lucien sat on a wet rock, his feet in a puddle. He abandoned your world for good. His despair was complete. It was now only a snapshot in a rich tourist collection. You, barked one of the rich. I snapped you five times. He threw Lucien ten pistetas. Lucien mumbled thanks in Spanish. 
The beggars show gratitude and a kind of discreet joy. Some of them rush to the nearest bar. I think this might, no, well, maybe. Hello? Hello? Hey, how do I turn you on? Um, I don't know what, what'll say phone on here. I mean, it says call, drop, auto. He is in the middle of something. So what does this do? Does this do it? That doesn't do it. So you think you might be on already? I. It says call on the phone or the little black. Okay. Yes, on my microphone. Oh, there's a phone here thing here. Okay. I'll bring that. There you go. Okay, there we found. Okay. Can you hear me in the headphones? Yes. Yes. So you're on then. Okay. Okay. Um, I hope so. I mean, if it's activated or whatever. You want... If not, that's okay. It'll just sound like you're talking to yourself. Okay. Do you want to just say hello to people? Uh, hello. 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 Who are you? Uh, my name is Zach. Okay, hi, Zach. And um, you were one of the people that I thought was going to maybe contact me. I was just reading this um, thing at a big table, the Chenet piece. It was kind of nice. By and, who? Um, Jean Chenet. It was about the beggars of Barcelona. It's really beautiful. Oh, I've never read it very much. Really. He, he's wonderful, but I mean, I stumble over these words because they're just they're just so incredible the way he packs them in there, and I get really tongue tied. But mm -hmm. who knows how to work out? So how are you, you doing? John Wieners is like Janae. No, no, different. No. Very different. Um, Janae had amazing balls. He was just a very, very confident, um, crazy, incredible man. He was. I mean, yeah. I mean, Wieners was actually crazy. And Wieners is a sweetheart, you know. I mean, what's crazy? You could. I mean, Wieners. You could bring home the mom and stuff. I don't think I would want mom to meet Janae. I think she might be kind of. Well, like, it depends on who your mom is, I guess. I'm talking about my mother. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. But I um, mean, he was a tougher, and he was a bit of a, you know, rough trade kind of guy. Sure. Right. Did you ever read that piece where, like, what was it, like, Time Magazine or some dumb, some newspaper or something sent him and Burroughs and Alan Ginsberg to Esquire. the I Chicago that, Convention? Right. Yeah, it was that, Esquire, Esquire, and like, yeah. they all wrote a little report. Of course, Burroughs was a cut up. Ginsberg's yeah. was kind of this like. Was Terry Sutherland sort of another one? But but Janae's was just him talking about how hot the cops were. That was yes, all yes. All and he talks. I think he talks about the muscles and the bulges in her pants, if I remember. Yes, I, yeah. that's correct. Yes, that is what I remember as well. Well, he loved the Black Panthers. He adored the Black Panthers, and he. Oh, he was talking about the cops and that. Right, but I mean, he really related to... Oh, sure. I, well, I mean, yeah, there's a lot of... At that period, there were a lot of homosexual writers who associated themselves with the plate of African yeah. Yeah. Like, There's tons of like writers who who romanticized that, and perhaps problematically, I don't really know. I'm sure, that, uh, I'm sure that that's quite offensive in a lot of ways, but I guess, I mean, you know, you're a product of your age to some degree, yeah. no matter how intelligent you are and uh, whatever. That's very true. Yeah, I just, I, I think, I just love him. And I found this. Um, you, do you remember Big Table? It, it Paul Carroll edited it, I think. Yeah. It, is, is that it's from your Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I found this number three, and it's really nice. Um, the stuff that's in it. Who's in it? Is Old Angel Midnight in there by Jeff? No, that's the first one. I I think I have that or I gave that to you. I don't know if I gave that to you. I don't know. Actually, James Liddy gave me a few issues of Big okay. Table at one point. And uh, making me promise to give them back. Um, I never did, actually. Mm -hmm. I, no, it's a little late. <laughs> well, if you don't have... And I, don't, I don't think... I mean, at this point, he, he he's all right with this. Yeah. But. Well, if you don't have number three, I'll give you this. Oh, okay. Um, did you want? I know we've talked about this, but this is just a sidebar. But I had to ask you this: um, Do you did you read a lot of Kerouac? Or do you like Kerouac a lot, or are you kind of? Um, like... I would have to read it again. I mean, definitely, yeah. I mean, of course, I. Yeah, I do. I mean, I think that Visions of Cody is amazing. I read all of it, and it was very fun and pleasurable to read. And a lot of people said parts that are sort of indulgent and boring, but I thought they were pretty funny and interesting and I don't know like 
I mean, yeah, I do. I do a lot. Okay, I because love, there's like, some stuff I found that I, I want to put together for you. Yeah, Vision oh, okay. Tacote is great. In, I mean, um, I'm, not, I'm not an obsessive or anything like some no, people are. No, But I like his books, you know? Like, I I don't need all the mem- memorabilia or anything. Like oh, yeah, all that. Like yeah. He actually wrote, you know? Yeah, I mean, people get a bit heavy-handed about that. Yeah, and I did when I was younger, just like a lot of people do. Like, ooh, new biography, or ooh, he published this in college. But, you know... It wasn't yeah. interesting until he just kind of gave up. Like, he wrote Town in the City, you know, and I didn't, I couldn't read that book. It was, like, really dry and boring. And and then it's like at some point he just sort of gave, I don't know, gave in or gave up. And that's when it was all just really good. He but just, I don't like Dharma Bums so much. I feel like that book feels like a pot boiler to me. I feel like Dharma Bums is the one book that's the least interesting to me by him. It doesn't. It, everyone says it's their favorite, but I feel like it's the most romantic and kind it's of the simplest. It's, a, it's the most period piece in yes. Hemingway esque, yeah. and I don't like those qualities in Hemingway. It's just, it's just this period piece sort of. I mean, all of Kerouac was, but the one the the ones that are really good are like the novella like ones, like mm. you know. Subterranean. No, the is Subterranean Tresessa, and, and Maggie uh, Cassidy. Actually, the the one where he's. Tristessa is a beautifully yeah, written novel. Yeah. Like the style is incredible, and it's, it's like nothing else. I mean, it's like it is sort of like this weird mix of Celine and like mm-hmm. Mark Twain or something. But on the other hand, um, yeah, I mean, like I don't love. I mean, as I've gotten older, I don't like totally love everything. I mean, no, I, I mean I've picked things out I like. Um, I liked Dharma Bund when I was younger, but then after a while, it just became kind of just like this magazine article yeah. somebody made this have... joke yeah it did feel like a magazine article to me that's yeah. not my favorite book of his no, at, all. It's not at all but you know what's funny though is that somebody may always used to make this joke to me when I was younger it kind of I thought it was a really pretentious thing to say but now I can kind of see how it's funny he said like oh man Jack Kerouac is the one book that's for people who don't like and I remember kind of being like, well, fuck you, yeah, people who are, you know. But in yeah. reality, you know, when I think about it, isn't that kind of a good thing? I mean, I don't know. <laughs> it, it is. I doesn't think that it say is something about it? Maybe yeah. not. I mean, sometimes it doesn't say anything about anything. Yeah. I think that a lot of times, though, the people got into them for the wrong reasons. I think if they could have yeah, just... Yeah, they romanticized the totally romanticized cultural just... aspect that isn't really the whole point. Of it. And that's probably what drove and made him... Well, it, there's a huge bitterness when, um, when back in the 70s, when my friend and I, who was another poet, um, decided to hitchhike to Naropa, we um, we thought that would be great, and so of course we hitchhike there, and it's really hard to hitchhike with two guys, but we of course run into every drunk, and we get there, and we run into Ginsburg, and we go to his class, he, he lets us go to a bunch of his classes, and at the end of the class, he's like, just chastises us, it's like we're like some kind of Kerouac freak you know for like thinking we're all these beatniks and stuff and he was just like he was so tired of that crap it's like yeah, yeah you know, I bet he was. let's he hitchhike was. across the country and be these groovy beatniks and I, my whole attitude was like fuck you no it wasn't that at all you know right. we came here because part of where I was coming from especially on the country and where we went to school we were just dying for things that would influence us something new and something that we couldn't find anywhere else and we found it there I mean that's where I ran into literally ran into Ted Berrigan and I never thought people like him were out there never yeah. and and did, even did, did, did Ted talk as much as everyone says he did Ted Berrigan yes and he the thing about him is it's his size and the gentleness to it I mean I, I imagine Charles Olson was kind of a similar way that they're just these huge demonstrative affectionate men and you think they're going to be just like these nasty mothers and they're the sweetest people in the world and they're engaging you and it's just like it's almost like they want you to take this test but they're going to help you cheat they want to make sure you succeed they want to do everything they can to help you along you know right. very he's very sweet and, he was, and the things are when he would just talk i mean this is my first exposure i'm like holy this is amazing do i are we doing this right okay it was um oh it was just totally amazing and um yeah. so from then on i just kind of like you know got stuck in it and pretty amazing I stuff i sometimes wonder now if 
um, there was this thing in the 50s where, like, if you were a really good talker, in other words, if you could talk eloquently on lots of subjects, not only in a casual... I mean, it was like there was this style to being a talker. Uh -huh. He was the talker. Robert Duncan, of course, was a very dogmatic talker, and, like, all these people were chatty. Kathy and Olsen would talk all day, and everyone talked all night and all day. I wonder if it's... I mean, I don't believe that's exaggerated either, because it was like... People spend all night on chat, so what's the difference? Or writing this blog, instead they just talk. But I wonder if there isn't like something now that's a little different, where it's like if you talk a lot, like it's almost like it. it, it I don't know. Academia is full of blabbermouth too, you know. <laughs> yeah, I think but, uh, I think people are afraid of people right now that talk too much. I, I think, think people are afraid of. Um, Talking. Well, I think they're afraid of putting their foot in their mouth. You know, that someone's going to have a freaking right. camera on them or something. Or, like, well, actually, I think people are sort of afraid of, and perhaps rightly, afraid of ideas. Okay. Sort of afraid of ideas, whereas in like, uh, or nuanced ideas. Everything has to be sort of like a brand of something. Whereas yeah. it, there are kinds of things that have a particular nuance to them that it's like hard to define, but yet it's very blatant. And that, I don't know if that's a quality one, says that one has a stylistic one, I guess everything does under the microscope, but at the same time, uh, it, uh, there does seem to be a want for, like, kind of obviousness, which is fine, you know, because I mean, everything at this point does function, everything's functional, everything is utilitarian uh, under the guise of playful fun. Yeah. Like, oh, this is so fun. Look at these crazy colors. It's just a commercial. <laughs> it, it's it's very disarming sometimes. I think that's why I'm kind of really removed from mainstream. It's not like... I actually think that the poetry is, like, one of the more exciting of the arts happening right now, from yeah. what I can tell. Like, I go to, like, art shows around here. I try to keep up a little, and I don't know. I find myself getting kind of bored a little bit, but... Uh, with a lot, with exceptions, but it's like there's so much interesting poetry being written right now. There's a lot, like, and it's it, it's it's like actually there surprising. There actually are a lot of really good writers. I don't think it's all negative, but there is certain like trends that sometimes you wonder if they don't swallow up writers who could have been even more interesting than if they hadn't like tried to write, say, a, you know, whatever. I I don't know. I don't know. But there's a lot of burnout. I know there's a lot of burnout with it because it just, it, people have the feeling, well, you have a pencil and paper, or you, anybody can write poetry, and there's a certain truth to it, but there's also huge lies within it. Not, I mean, everybody has the ability of writing poetry, but that doesn't mean yeah. that everybody's going to write good poetry or, or poetry that right. reaches so anyone matter, else. Right. right. Uh, but at but, the same time, like, it, the approach matters, or, or your, the intended effect matters matters and yes. uh you know what i mean it's like uh if there's a there's a lot of work that seems to like narrow the concern of the art to one specific quality like you know like this this work is only about the sound of words that's it right. all this is about and i that's mean very limited. i like that kind of work too sometimes but um I like to be fooled into thinking that we're supposed to be worried about something else. <laughs> I like to be fooled into thinking that we're supposed to be worried about something else once in a while because there's a truth in the fooling if you do the fooling right. right. I like to be surprised. I just want something that all of a sudden will come out of left field and just smack me. Yeah. I like that. I don't. I don't like predictable things. Smack I you. Yeah, I really like it when someone will read something and I'll look at them like, whoa, yeah. that is who's really... An unpredictable, who's an unpredictable poet to you that you find those, like, they just, you are surprised. That surprised me? Couple, well, you. A couple lines. Definitely you. I mean, I like, I like, um, I just, I like I the way... I don't know if I agree with that. I mean, a lot of the poems that I've written in the last five years are kind of... I don't know. Mm -hmm. I'm not so sure that they work. Well, I mean, all the time. Yeah, but, but I'm but I'm a different person, and so I'm going to be reading into it with all my experiences and all my life. So uh -huh. it might not. I mean, 
I might be reading things into it, which I, I believe you had intended, but they might affect me a lot differently yeah. than you. I mean, for me, it's kind of like, I think writing poetry is a bit of a chore. I think it's kind of like, I, I sometimes I'd rather sweep the floor than write. You know, it just becomes like this whole thing that, okay, now that I did this, now I gotta do this, and then I have to do this, and it becomes kind of like, real tasky for me um, and so there's going to be different things to discover oh my god Dakota just showed up and had just a ton of food here food? yeah um, Zav and um, the rabbi made just incredible dinner this um, cabbage well you were here when they were starting to cook it cabbage soup and oh, rice nice. and beans and stuff yeah it's actually kind of sweet I don't know why rabbi loves soup pretty good. I mean, I've, I've had horror stories about cabbage, and this is really good. It's really delicious. I just, I like, you know, I've, I've kind of strayed away from eating a lot. I told you I'm just doing the peanut butter and jelly thing. But why, when you're sitting... Why would you do that? Because, again, it just, it, because food just became like, you know, I have to eat so then I can walk so you're around. you're trying to live an aesthetic life, like a monk? Well, there's always a, a part of that, but there's also a part that it's just... I would rather be doing something else than eating, just like I'd rather, you know, be doing something besides pissing, you know, just sometimes yeah. I don't want to deal with that. And food, except now I'm a liar because just eating this food, I'm like, whoa, this stuff, this rice and beans were pretty amazing. Yeah. And they're so simple and they can, you know, be screwed up, but they're just, they're, they're great. Yeah. And so now, huh? Lentil beans. Those are lentils? Mm -hmm. Oh, maybe that's why I like that's them. That's what they look like. I love lentils. Um, well, who do you, I mean, so I, I mentioned you. Um, who do I like? I'm trying to think of, I mean, I like Zoe's work. Um, I'm trying to think of who I, I've heard recently that are just really, I mean, I like Bethany. I don't know if you heard Bethany. Um, Price stuff. Yeah, I did. I like. I like. Um, I like them. Her newer stuff I like a lot more. When I first met her, it was just like she was like, show me these poems and like, what should I do with these? And I'm like, Ugh. like I'm not gonna tell you what to do with them. No, I can't. Oh yeah, what like, do we do with them? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm kind of like that's that's yours. I mean, you know, I can't really. Well, I'm not. I'm not a good. I don't believe in being an editor. I don't like that. I can put yeah. together things. And it can yeah. construct things, but I don't want, I don't like making a lot of decisions. I mean, yeah. Because part of me is I trust, if 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 I read the people's work and it, it moves me and it does something to me, then I'm going to trust in, in it. And I'm going to trust to a certain extent, even if they make leaps and they change things and they do things like, you know, kind of like, what the hell are you doing here? I'm going to trust, huh? I said sure, yeah. And I'm going to trust it, and I'm going to go with it, and that's kind of why I can, like, I have a real hard time with the whole sellout thing, because it's hard to judge it. I mean, I think at times, you know, very successful bands do it, but I don't see poets selling out. I don't see that, so... What about uh, Billy Collins or... Uh that they do? I don't really consider or them. Family. I mean, that's a different thing. I don't, I'm, I'm picking really... That's like Rob McEwen. That's like Rob I'm McEwen. I'm kind of or, picking obvious targets. I don't know. The whole fellow question is hard to uh, grapple with because it's a, essentially a... It's, I mean, a, it's a value idea, judgment like, for me. It's just like... Yeah, I, I mean, a lot of people who are really made great work or have done great work are all kind of sucked into the commercial right. art industry or to, like, copyright industry and... Yeah, that takes a lot of their time, but in the 50s, people had to write pot boilers all the time, too. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I, I wouldn't place an ethical judgment on what one needs to do to get money or can do too much. But at the same time, you know, it's like if I'm working for a pharmaceutical company, yeah, I'll have a perhaps a moral degree in there. I mean, yeah. I don't know, it's hard to extricate yourself from the uh, capitalist mindset. I mean, that's why I love William Carlos Williams. I mean, he could deliver babies and then write poems on prescription pads. I think that's kind of a yeah. a nice, you know, and that's a wonderful reality, too. I mean, to be able to have, you know, both those things, be responsible for both those things. The word. Do you think Dr. Williams would have been for Obamacare? Yes. I think anybody with any kind of sense should be for it. I think the thing is, for me. I think me, he would have been single payer. 
all it is for me is like do something something has to be done and we can fix it later but this whole thing is because i remember when i was like more involved in grassroots stuff what the hell just happened something just popped here Okay. Um, that we were working for national health care. Oh, you're gone. That's why. Okay, I think we just lost Zach, and I think did I lose myself too. Hello? Yeah, there I am. Um, this is just fascinating trying to figure out what the hell I'm doing here. Um, <laughs> All right, so I'm going to wait a few more minutes, and I'm going to go back to reading this, um, Janae, and then um, let's see what happened with Zach, or if I hung up on him, or he hung up on me. Um, okay, so kind of where I was was they were taking photographs, right? And then um, so one of the um, tourists goes, you, barked one of the rich. I snapped you five times. He threw Lucy in five pestas. Lucy in mumbled thanks in Spanish. The beggar showed gratitude and a kind of discreet joy. Some of them rushed to the nearest bar. Others resumed their crouched positions and looked asleep. But they were really contemplating their own truth, which would, which would save them, the pure state of desolation. The scene was only one of many I wanted to use to purify Lucian's mind. His mind must reach a perfection worthy of the kind of happiness I want him to have. This is what I know about him, his kindness, sweetness, vulnerability. I don't know his faults. I don't want to know these situations where his sufferings might kill him. Yet to love him more than myself, I must know his weakness too, his fragility, that I can never be tempted to abandon him. My adventures serve him. I have lived them. To the image I want to make of Lucian, I now give cruelly the same experiences. But it is my own body and mind that suffered them. From this, I construct an image of Lucian, which he will imitate. I have tried to describe clumsily how a man takes upon himself the suffering of others, but I can only hint, and then vaguely, at the mechanism of how to do this. It is too late. I am too tired to try and describe it better. I think that's why I love him. It just. To, to just to take that situation and and just to not necessarily to elevate it beyond something it is, but to to make you so aware and sensitive to the fact and sensitive to you know to the situations. I mean, the thing that I, that for me, Janae was you know, he was a true lover. Not I mean, we can say man, but meaning mankind. But he was a true lover, you know. Of, of the human condition and he related definitely to the poor, the thieves, the prisoners, the fags, the queers. I mean, he he is single handedly the the person who made me very comfortable with the word queer and and I feel honored. I feel honored to be in the same boat, you know. Um I kinda love it that, that Janae felt that Andre Gide was his master and Andre Gide felt that Oscar Wilde was his master. You know, and it's just, it's really sweet. And, um, but I don't mean sweet, like, you know, saccharine. I just mean like really touching that, you know, that so often, I mean, just talking to Zach, there's, there's just so much bullshit that we have to like cut through every day, you know, not just to make art, but to exist and to make our own lives something beyond just breathing and eating and defecating and that there is there's there's a joy there's just this incredible purpose that's beyond us that that there's times that I think I know and there's times I want to know and there's times that I don't I want to be like on that train just going forward or even if they have to back up and release one of the cars I just want to I want to be on it and I think when I was talking to Zach about poets that I like, I want to be able to, to trust them that what they're going to do when they put together a piece, and there's pieces I like already, so I already have this kind of like step in there. I want to continue with that, you know, because I feel for me, um, it's not just necessary that, that poetry is a field, and I take that literally as a field of clover or a field of alfalfa. It's, to me... 
it's water. It's like a lake, and I want, I want to go into it, and I want to to trust, and I want to keep going further and further into it. Because um, for me, water is is it. Water is the most one of the most purifying things besides just holding somebody. I mean, to immerse yourself in water and to let go, you know. And I I can't swim, you know. It wasn't until I was in the ocean that I realized, wait a minute, this salt water kind of holds me up, and I felt a confidence in swimming, but. Water terrifies me, but at the same time, it calls to me, you know, whether it's because of how we're constructed, whether it's because of being in the womb, whether it's, you know, my relationship with my mother or the tides or the moon. I don't know. All I know is water is really good and is purifying. And for me, that's what poetry is. I mean, poetry can be like, oh, God, please, you know, I just hope the hell I'm high that I can drift out of this. Or it's like just it's gorgeous it's like the first time i was able to ever see a jackson pollock painting in real life because all i saw were those little things out of books and i knew they were big but it doesn't prepare your, yourself it's like it's probably like seeing a rocket for the first time yeah we know what rockets are like you know we know it's spaceships but to see it and to hear it i mean to me that's what a lot of this stuff is about and i love the midwest and i will always be a midwesterner but My God, you know, I love New York City. I love going there. I just love being overwhelmed. I love being so overwhelmed. I'm like trembling with anguish and joy and fear and just like so much that I just, I feel like I'm just going to piss in my pants. It's just, it's just, it's incredible. I like going back to that little boy and, um, and, and going through these things with them. Um. I guess I'm going to go a few more minutes and then we'll wrap this up. Um, I think it's because um, I had dug through a bunch of these old um, chapbooks that I started going back into some of my old poetry. And believe me, I'm not going to go through this whole thing where I start reading all this stuff to you because that would be just torture. but I was just kind of thinking, you know, I, I was trying to find this one, um, which are just these one-line poems. I don't have it with me. Um, but um, there's there's some funny things. Um, I guess um, I want to thank Zach, Zach um, for calling in. Um, and um, Zach has a um, wonderful journal called OW, O-W. Um, just did a release thing at um, Reverse Video, and it's um, posted online. Um, I've known Zach for quite a while, and I just, I mean, I've always felt him incredibly gifted. Um, always in a hurry, always trying to catch up to things, but, you know, it's it's easy to um, to watch somebody go through things, and the thing about Zach is, I, you know, he, he's really got it. He's He's got a lot of wonderful things going in his energy is incredible and um he's just wonderful he's a wonderful friend and um anytime you can see zach peeper you know go listen to his um, poetry listen to his music with the trusty knives he's he's immense um and the same thing goes for a lot of poets i mean i, I b- believe that zach is right there's some really exciting things happening with poetry right now um looking at just different, you know, ways of, of constructing it, deconstructing it. Um, I think it's good. Um, art will always be somewhat problematic. Um, I, I talked about, especially um, last week's show um, with Shannon and um, Rob, I think, I, I mean, I, I think their, their art show was just profound. I think it's great. So I, I've been to some really amazing things. But a lot of times, you know, just it isn't you know it isn't working for me i'd like to see more sculpture i definitely would like to see more sculpture and um there's a part of me that really wants to go see the nutcracker um i don't know why i think it's it's not necessarily the season but i kind of want to see those big old costumes and stuff um and i have a friend that really wants to go and i think i think it's important and you know no matter how old you are that at least you see the nutcracker once swan lake and couple other things at the same time you know supporting other dance companies around here um kelly anderson is just an amazing dancer um so i think um i'm gonna go wish everybody a happy holiday and thank you for listening and thank you for being there and if you're not just um 
I guess just the illusion that you're there is enough for me. Um, take care.